you can always come back from something if you put the work in. And um, so, you know, over time, I hope to prove that out and do many more records and play many more shows. There will be bumps in the road, but life is so impermanent. It's just the way it is. And you have to work through these things as we get older and um, you can find a way if you work at it. M Shadows joins us refreshed and renewed straight from his latest vocal lesson and brimming with excitement for the release of Life Is But A Dream, the long-awaited new album from Avenged Sevenfold. Mixing together dance influences, heavy riffs and a 78-piece orchestra, it is a sprawling near-concept album exploring that biggest subject of all, what it truly means to be alive and live life to the fullest. I'm James Wilson Taylor, and this is the Rock Sound album story of Life Is But a Dream by Avenged Sevenfold. I guess something you will have been asked a lot about already is the fact that this is this is the longest gap you guys have had between studio albums, and I guess I wanted to know when did it feel like yeah we're ready yeah this is the right moment now. I know you must have been writing music on and off in between, but when did it feel? ready to go ready to actually hit the ground running and say no now is the time when we put out another album again yeah um to be honest you know we had recorded most of the music like most of the tracking um probably uh like by 20 i mean it's so hard it's so blurry now with covid and everything like i, I don't want to mix my dates up but we we finished the tracking pretty early on right like no vocals um, no solos, no like, um, like extras, but we kind of had like the drums and the bass and like some of the guitars and we had messed with the tones and done all that stuff pretty early. We kind of let it sit for like a year through, through COVID. Um, well, actually no, like right after COVID we were, we let it sit because one thing we were waiting for was my voice to get to where I was comfortable, not only singing, but then knowing that once we put the record out, I'd have to go do it live. So it wasn't really necessarily about you know, I went through a really major injury, um, an injury to where most doctors told me I wasn't going to sing again. And um, I, I have to say, just purely based out of finding the right vocal coach, working really hard at it and technique, I was able to do something that most of the doctors said I physically wasn't going to be possible. Um, so once that started coming around and we were like, okay, we can, we can go on tour with this. It's going to work you know, it's getting better and you're kind of projecting out like, okay, in six months, it's going to be here. And in a year, it's going to be here. You know, we started saying, okay, well, let's go in there and finish the record up at least. And then we actually had a hell of a lot more work to do than we thought we did. You know, like we, we got in there, we thought we were going to finish it all up within a month and it took another six months. And then, um, then, you know, getting with Andy Wallace and, and getting the strings done and, and, you know, mixing took another three or four months when usually it takes like, you know, you book them out for a month and, and you get it done. And he, he has a different lifestyle now where he travels a lot and we were totally respectful of that. And just like, all right, let's mix for two weeks at a time. So the convoluted answer is that one, but the, the short answer too long didn't read is we've had a lot of the music on the back burner. Everything took longer than we thought it would. Um, and so once we started rolling again, that we got so into it that, um, luckily we just grinded because it did take an extra year of work when we thought it would take a month or so. You know, let's get into the actual sound of the record as a whole. I mean, the, the, what I love about it is right from the off, it's it's unexpected because, you know, first Avenged record in a minute, you hit play, we're hit with some of your softest, most beautiful music you guys have ever put together. It changes pretty quick, but it is like, I love the, the juxtaposition there. Like, no, let's hit them with something so soft and gentle before we really, <laughs> really get going. Tell me a little bit about that opening. There must have been some thought process around that, I'm sure. We have all these influences, but we try not to go too far um, in novelty area. And that was just influenced by, um, that was we felt it was very welcoming. It felt like very beginning of life. And when you think about the context of the record and how the ending is like kind of the curtain call, the end of life and how the beginning of life, it's like the cycle that all kind of plays together. We just felt it was fitting to kind of open that way, but then instantly you're thrown into this world of anxiety and this world of like chaos. Right. And so, you know, going from that and, and what I meant by novelty is that it gets very like, almost Godfather Italian 
but we don't want to go too far with using all those instruments, right? Like you could have gone, you could have gone a hundred percent there if you bring out some of those instruments and like, you know, but we didn't do that. We just kind of lay the groundwork. Um, and then what was interesting to us was like this really basic four, four riff, but then using all these different vocal sort of um, arrangements around it, where, where it's like spitfire chaos, where it's kind of overlapping and then kind of it goes into the the refrain and then the as it may, as it may on an off time. And you're kind of like thrown into this whirlwind of what's happening. And then so we were just trying to play with people's emotions um, in different ways, right? On this record, where you're either doing it with a crazy tempo change or you're doing it with a vocal melodic to minor happening over the same thing, or you're doing it with like a vocal that's in three, four, while the, while the riffs in four, four. So you're always trying to like keep people off kilter, but like have some sort of payoffs. Um, but then keep, you know, not letting them sit there for too long. Um, I think one thing that we've done in the past that I, I don't hate at all, but we were exploring different feels, but we would stay there for a long time. We would just like kind of really like soak them in on this one. We don't, we don't really let anyone like get their footing for too long. Um, it's, it's kind of a ADD or ADHD society. And a lot of the stuff we've been listening to is very like you get in and out quicker. And we wanted to explore that on this record. But I like as well that there's, there's clearly a huge mix of influences on there, but you kind of twist the expectation among them a little bit. I mean, a good example is I've heard, you know, a, a couple of you guys say in a few places about Daft Punk being an influence on there. And in my head, you go like, oh, is it going to be like some four to the four dance beat that we're getting in there? Is it going to be like super, super electronic? And I didn't really know what to expect. And then we get to a song like Easier or a song like Ordinary. And it's like, oh, it's random access memories, Daft Punk. It's Vocorda. It's, it's a little bit of that... I've forgotten the name of it, but the one they did with Julian Casablanca, Instant Crush with Julian Casablanca, because there's like a little bit of that in there. It's a great song. But I just love the fact that that's that's where the Daft Punk comes in there. It's like, yeah, you've got that expectation, but no, 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 no. We're going to do something that's very, very specific with that influence in there too. Yeah, and I, you know, when I look at Daft Punk, I, I think of them as total goats, like some of the greatest of all time. And it's not because of the, you know, the, the, outward sound it's just they're such brilliant songwriters they're like their their ability with melody and putting songs together and, and and this warm blanket this feeling that they put like that you have when you're listening to daft punk especially random access memories but a lot of their old stuff too um all their stuff and you can just tell their and so like when we when we think of daft punk it's like yeah there's vocoder and there's there's these kind of things you could pull from but also just like the way they put together melody, right? Like the way, and they've been borrowed so much from like hip hop artists and like um, from DJs and people like sampling their stuff. And the reason they're so highly sampled is because they're like the Elton John of our time. They're like, they're like, they're just such musicians, musicians, but they're able to like do it in a way that anybody can listen to that and feel something. And so I, I, just, I just respect them so much more than like what's on the outside right? It's like, they're just, there's just certain artists like that, that just really touch me, um, in like a, in a, you know, deeply in the heart and pulling the heartstrings and Daft Punk's one of them. And so even like, if it's a melody, like, even if it's like, like a melody, like on game over, no, 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 that could be influenced by Daft Punk, but we're just not using their tools, you know? Um, so yeah, it's like, all those like really great musicians were really highly influenced, you know? Yeah, in terms of you, who you guys were working with, I mean, we've got to mention this epic orchestra that's a part of this record. And not just like, it's not like when some bands do it, they're like, oh, I want to do a specific track with a specific orchestra, which I understand they've got an idea in there, but it feels like you've integrated this to be a bigger part of the record in a lot of ways. Tell me about your process there and and I guess actually getting to work with these incredible musicians you got on there. Yeah, um, you know, we, we have a lot of tools now, which is great. Um, so we went from being a band that would kind of vaguely write out our our um, orchestra parts, like for like, I want to see you tonight part one and all that stuff coming up and the wicked end and all these things that we've done through our career. But even like up to like a little piece of heaven, we had to really rely on um, outside people. Like, you know, we had Steve Bartek and Mark Mann from Oingo Boingo help with a little piece of heaven, but we couldn't sit there and write every single part because we just didn't have the tools. And now with like, we, 
with Pro Tools and with the way, like all the stuff we're using, we were able to write every part out of these, um, you know, these orchestra pieces, whether it's from Death or whether it's from Cosmic or all these, like there's a lot of stuff hidden in all the songs. Even nobody has a bunch of stuff, but we were able to sit there and really like grind on it and not necessarily have to just go in there with an idea and then hope it turned out well. We wrote everything down to a T and then we went to these really great arrangers and we went outside the box. You know, we went to these guys that work with Snarky Puppy, which is a progressive band um, that we we really like and we like their arrangements and we like how they think outside the box on all these different things. And instead of going to the normal guys that do the rock records, we went with people that have never really done what we do. And we kind of showed them what we had and they you know, recommended this particular group of people. So they got the team together that could play these parts. Um, but another thing we did that, that we had been reading up a lot on is we've always been really easy to deal with in the studio in terms of like, okay, that's how you record it. And we know that this is the, the proper way to mic this or do that. And we saw a bunch of stuff with Kanye in the studio where he was like breaking a lot of rules in terms of like, wanted this sound and it wasn't happening. And then they did all these different things to get these sounds and really put the orchestra in uncomfortable situations, right? Where they were having to, you know, maybe hit strings harder than they wanted to or play things that were technically wrong to get the sound that they're going for. So we really kind of use that influence to go like, okay, we know what we want it to sound like, but it's not traditional or we want the bow to be sharper here. Or we want the mic to be further down the tuba because we want to hear the breath instead of the, you know, like the softer sound of it. So whatever it was, we were able to get with a team that allowed us to do that. So we had 78 people in there and we just spent all day with them and just really hammered these ideas home of what we wanted to get done. Um, and then we had a bunch of notes that they thought were probably wrong. And we told them, no, we're building tension. It's like right of spring. We want to make people uncomfortable. And they, and then they bought into it and they did it. Right. And so it was a really great collaboration of getting the people that were willing to see the vision, getting the the engineers and the, and the people that are, actually talking to the musicians in their language and letting them know that we're going far with some of these things and then getting someone like Joe Breezy in there to conduct it all and say, okay, this is what we want. And then also being able to make a decision and just say, this is right. Let's move on. Right. Instead of overthinking things and being like total, you know, nerds about it. Like, Oh, it's not, you know, like, no, this is it. We're going. And Joe Breezy helps with that because, you know, when you're in there and you're, setting up six, seven, eight drum kits. At some point you just have to say, that's it and move on because we're not sampling stuff. We're not overdubbing stuff We're this is the tone and we're moving on. And I think that's a really important aspect too. So another convoluted answer, but yeah, a lot of really special people. It's not all us, but you got to be able to know when something's right. And you also have to be able to know when to push when something's not how you want it to be. I love hearing you talk about speaking the same language with musicians, though, because that's so, so important. I love that that must have been such a eureka moment. You reference like right of spring there. I mean, obviously, any musician in that position is going to go, right, I get exactly what you mean. I, I I just love that being able to find those reference points. That's when music becomes like, not to get too, you know, pretentious about it, but that's when it becomes a universal language, right? It, like totally. we find those little connection points and suddenly that must have opened up the entire project for you, I'd imagine. Yeah, totally. Like when you can... um when you can explain to them that that's a feeling you're going for, or that's a like the confusion or the chaos and let them know that because how do you come in as a hired musician and then think you're playing on a rock record and then you hear things that you're like, okay, this doesn't sound. And then you're just going to play it for a couple hours and then leave. Or if we can express to you, we're trying to go far. We're trying to make it uncomfortable. We need more out of you. This doesn't sound right. It's distorting. Yes, we want that. You know, so you need to make them feel comfortable with, okay. And you have to get the right people that go like, okay, well, my name's on this record as well. I don't want people to think I'm just, you know, a, a hack, you know, like, no, this is what we want from you. And so you got to get the right people. And that's, and, and there are so many reference points throughout the landscape of human music, right. Or just like things that we can pull and, and all these guys know them all, right. These are these are professionals. They, they, they've played everything. And so you just got to let them know we're going there. Like, let's go. And and usually they get excited, right? Usually they're like pumped on it. So they're like, okay, this is cool. Let's move on to the kind of lyrical content here, because I've heard you talk as well, you know, you guys about 
a number of different reference points. You had certain writers that you were kind of channeling in certain areas and things, but also there's a few lyrics dotted around there that have actually gone quite a few years back, right? Like a few things you were, I'm thinking particularly like Beautiful Morning. I've seen you talk about how actually a couple of lines in there were, were kind of from quite a few years back. Um, what was it about those moments that, that made you guys maybe hold on to them? Or did it just feel like, hey, now's the right time to actually make use of these? Yeah, so first I'll go back to Mattel because there's a bridge that Jimmy had written a long time ago. We always sung it. It was a Pinkley Smooth. It was him and Brian that wrote it, actually. And it's the da 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 But it was under completely different chords. And the chords we were playing in Mattel, I just started singing it. And it was, you know, like when like notes rub in weird ways or they do these weird things. And I was like, that is weird how Jimmy's melody line makes these chords these kind of they're kind of basic chords something we normally wouldn't do like they're kind of like like i could hear those chords like you could repurpose them and put them in a blink song almost the like they're they're kind of but when that melody comes over it rubs and tugs and pulls in weird ways so we're like that's brilliant we got to use it and they're like well that's like something from pinkly smooth should we do it and then we're like i'm like yeah let's just let's just do it you know and like it was like a nice little tribute to something that we've always like sung in our own minds and never put out there. And it's done in a cool way because it's got different chords under it. And then beautiful morning, beautiful day, all that stuff. Brian, that's another thing that in our childhood growing up, they would always sing it. They'd be playing on the guitar. It's a beautiful morning. It's a beautiful day. Everybody is smiling. And like just something that's very um, creepy about it. Just like, why is everybody off? <laughs> you know, like, why is everyone like, so Mr. Rogers, and it just seemed like a nice juxtaposition inside that song, which is one of the more standard songs on the record. You know, it's like, it's got cool tempo changes and shifts, but to be honest, if it didn't have that chorus, which we really enjoyed, I don't think we would have kept the song on the record. And then, but we love the chorus. And then to add that bridge in it, it seemed like it was like, okay, now it's got its footing and it's got its like little tweak in it. And we've got this melody that we've sung our whole lives. So even if people didn't like it or get it, it was something that was emotionally cool to us, like kind of a, a thing that we've all had as a group um, of, of friends. Um, and then Brian went to town on it and just turned it into like very Beatles, Beach Boys-esque in terms of the arrangement. But again, trying to stay away from getting too novelty. Um, that's like his biggest word is like, don't do it too much on the nose. Um, but it does sound like a, a throwback to that era. Now, one thing we did with it that we didn't keep on the record is we did some spatial mixing on it. And so we had it go, like, it almost sounds like you're in a backyard. It would go to the back of your headset. And then, like, it would start, like, floating in and out. And then it would come. But the problem was, like, when we would test it on different speakers, it just never had the same effect. So it was, like, one of those things where it could, like, if you were listening to it in your car, it would just ruin it. And then, like, if you listen to it in headphones, it was amazing. So it was one of those things where we had this cool little trick and we were so dead set on it. And then I just don't think we were able to like nail it. So we just left it pretty standard. Um, but yeah, that's a little backstory on it. But yeah, it, those are two things that the Rev definitely was a part of that group of like, you know, childhood. Yeah, no, that's amazing to hear. It's just nice to be able to make nods to that. And I also love the fact that, you know, we talked a lot about how music, where, you know, there's these big sweeping moments and obviously a lot of grandiose moments that are really, you know, kind of skillfully done here. Um, but you're not afraid to have fun as well. And that's that's lyrically too. There are, you know, th the bestest part of waking <laughs> up being an obvious one, but there's like, there's gags, there's actual gags. In here, and that's always fun. I guess that must be something important, right? Because, you know, of course you're going to take what you do incredibly seriously, but you want to have some moments of fun in there too, right? Especially when it comes to lyrics. Yeah, I think it's, I've never been able to articulate why we would do some of the things we do like that, but you're, you're, you're nailing it. And it's, it's almost like when I think of like a Quentin Tarantino movie and how serious those movies are, but they're funny as hell. Like there's so many funny things that go on. Um, I think other funny ones are, I say threesome and, uh, in game over. It's like, like, like just part of life, just, you know, random threesome in there. And, and so we were cracking up at that. Like, we're like, imagine this person opening this booklet for the first time. It's like, oh yeah, serious, serious, serious. And it's like threesome. And then the record stops like, wait, wait a second, like rewind. Like, what am I listening to here? And then yeah, the bestest part of waking up comes right after that, you know, the old Folgers commercial, but 
best part of waking up didn't fit. So I'm like, bestest. And then we just started cracking up. So we're like, oh, you got to leave that. Um, I think another funny one is um, the one the robot says, I want to be the human you be. And we're like, so you're rhyming B with B. We're like, well, it's a robot. It's messing up. And like, we're just cracking up. Like, so definitely having fun with it. I, I just don't think, I think part of the seriousness of death always looming in this sort of existential thing. And part of the message is like, and Wes Lang puts it perfectly. He's like, my job as an artist to tap you on the shoulder and remind you to live life to your fullest, right? Death is right there. And it's not supposed to be a sad thing. It's that you're here. Now I'm reminding you that you need to, you need to shape up, right? You need to like live your life and do what you want to do. And I think that if you take the record too seriously, lyrically, then you're not doing that. Like part of the fun is like, we're having fun making music and we're, it's our art and we're putting it out there and there is a message, but we can have fun doing it as well. It leads very nicely onto uh, the actual artwork of the record. Now, of course, we've seen certain elements of, of that art throughout your career. You know, the idea of skull imagery, that kind of thing. But I really, I really like the style of this, man. Like it's, it's, it obviously speaks to the themes of the record as a whole. But it's very striking, that image. Like, tell me a little bit about putting that together and, and I guess, again, how it does speak to the themes of the record as a whole, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try to give you the quick version because it's a long story. But, you know, I met Wes Lang about six years ago. And Wes, um, I, I, I can safely say he's my favorite artist of all time. Just going into his studio, it's like, it's like walking in like this... Um, it's like walking into the temple of time in Zelda, right? Like the, the world stops <clears throat> and um, you're just in there and it's like, you just feel like you're in this, in this void and it's, it's unbelievable. And so, you know, for years I had asked him if he would do anything for us. And he said no many times. Cause he just doesn't do that stuff. He's very hard to get to know. He's very hard to get to do anything. He's done very few things in his career, but he's like one of those hermit sort of, uh, artist that everyone wants a piece from him, but he won't do it. So it makes it more, you know, hard to get him to care. Um, over the course of our friendship, he knew we were doing this record. He knew the struggles I was going through. We were always hanging out together and I started sending him demos of the record and he had, was sending me paintings that he was doing. And the only, you know, caveat was don't put them out there because people jack his stuff and they make merch of it before it's out. And so he did this painting called nobody and the painting, nobody, I would put it on the screen with Brian Sin and we would, we started writing the song, nobody did this painting. And I sent him the, the song and he was just blown away. And then years later he came back and, you know, after many no's, one day he just started doing all this art and sending it to me. And he said, he just had to do it. And it spoke to me and it spoke to him. And he said, listen, I've been listening to the demos and I want you guys to use this for your record. And we were like blown away. Yeah. So the art was kind of influencing the art back and forth. And so we went into a partnership with them and we knew it was a different aesthetic for rock to have the t-shirts the way we do and the, and the tan artwork and the, and just doing that highly stylized, you know, thing. And, you know, one thing that was funny, it still is a juxtaposition because the record's very bright and the art is very, you know, monotone. And it's interesting because all the things he's written on the art and all the, the ideas of it work very well with the lyrics, but it's a very cool juxtaposition because when you put on the record, there are bright moments of it, but the art kind of grounds you in this sort of reality of, of this um, life experience that we're going through. And so I think it, I think it complements it really well. I think the art on this record is just as important as the music. And this is the first time that we've actually had the time to actually put the whole vision together instead of being told, you know, we've got three weeks, where's the album cover? You know, we've, we've worked on this art for a year and a half now and we've worked on the album and that's part of helping with the record taking so long that we actually had the time to make a music video that took months to put together and make a, a campaign that took a half a year to put together and make art that took a year and a half to get the deal done. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I'm glad you brought it up because to me, it, it just all plays into what we're trying to kind of get out there at this point.
because again, we're talking about complete packages here, everything speaking to those same themes. Um, Life is but a dream. Obviously, there's a title track there as well. So I guess what came first, really? Did you did you write to a title track or did you already have that in mind being what you wanted to sum up this record? No, I mean, when I was thinking about the lyrical themes and how I was being affected in my life outside of music um, and just really observing consciousness, really observing what it is that we're all doing here um, in terms of going to bed every night, um, you go somewhere, right? Um, something happens, but it's like that eternal um, void, that blackness, which is what I assume kind of happens when, when we, when we move on, right? We lose our ego, we lose ourself and we're, we're gone. Um, and so I started playing with the idea of like, well, which one's the dream, which one's real and do that? Does it even matter? Right. And like, it's just kind of this turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on. And then just thinking of the overall turn off, turn on, you come into this world, you learn how we do things here. <laughs> we, you learn what's important here. You learn what success is here. Um, but it really holds no weight outside of this kind of human construct of this society and tribe we've built um, and what it means to be a human. And then one day you turn off and then it just struck me, you know, life is but a dream. And it's this saying that we've all heard our whole life and most of us don't really think much of it. You know, there's a, a nursery rhyme and there's these things, that, um, there's things that we do every day that are, you know, stop and smell the roses, right? These simple things that are like very actually deep and meaningful. If you take the time and go, okay, well, what is, what is a thought? What is living in the present? What is actually being here instead of thinking of the next thing I have to do? And so even though life is but a dream has been used a million times, I just felt it was such a, it hit me really hard. And it was such like a thing that I was feeling deeply that I didn't care that it had been used before. I didn't care that it um, could be looked at as a children's, you know, row, row, row your boat or whatever. It just really struck me. And I felt we could redefine what it meant um, at least to our fans and to people that hear this record and go, Oh, life is but a dream. There's a lot of deep um, anchors here and weightiness to that term. And so I felt it was kind of cool. I mean, not to get too analytical here as well, but the the other key thing there is it, it ends in an ellipsis. There's there's those three little dots, which which can mean a number of things. I mean, you mentioned there the idea of pondering what comes next. Is there nothing at all? Is there something there? Is it a fade to black? I guess is that is that what that's implying? That I guess it must have been important to you to have the idea that maybe the dream doesn't end altogether. I suppose. Yeah, that those those three little dots always felt like they fit there to me. And I, you know, I was one of those guys that, you know, I'm an atheist. So I would argue with all my religious friends all the time. And then I had this, you know, this five MEO DMT experience and it actually, um, it, it, it made me feel not that I was wrong or that I was right. It made me feel that it didn't matter. Um, it made me feel that all my friends that had been arguing with me all those years were right and that I was right as well. And all that mattered was me giving them a hug and realizing that we were the same sort of thing. Right. And so what it taught me is that we all have these ways we cope with this place and we have these answers we try to find that are probably not answerable at least yet. Um, and it doesn't really matter what you think or believe as long as as long as you can um, at least for yourself find some sort of meaning or purpose. Um, and that's a very personal journey, right? It's not somebody handing it to you or whatever you have to. And, and a lot of time um, that can only be given to you if, if you, if you realize there is no inherent meaning or purpose. So the three little dots just mean whatever you want it to mean, right? It, it, it's not for me to tell you, I know what I think. I know what makes sense in my head, but um, but I also know what you think in your head is also just as valid and right. It doesn't, there's no right or wrong. Yeah. There's no light or dark. It's the same thing.
before I let you go, we've got to talk about the future is how we wrap all these up a little bit. So I guess the starting point there is live shows. You know, as we started out in this conversation, we were talking about changing in vocals and everything. But beyond that, I suppose, actually getting these new songs in front of the crowd is always going to change the dynamic of them. It's always going to change how you feel about them, seeing the fans actually get the, the taste of it firsthand. Um, Area 51, I guess, was the first show. Tell me a little bit about that experience and and finally getting to see some reactions to this new music. Yeah, Area 51, I would just call a colossal um, anxiety. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where there's so much buildup after coming back. And there's it's, we live in a different world now, right? Like, I know that if things are bad or good, they can go bad or better. And we can work on things. And some things we maybe nail that night and we won't nail the next time. So I... But the, but knowing that everybody's sitting there with their phones and then everyone's going to judge things off a phone and that you're playing these things for the first time and you're trying to do something special for the fans, but it's just a different world we live in now. Um, so it creates a lot of anxiety, right? It creates a lot of things that you you can do your best to kind of put on the back burner. Um, so that show, I don't really have many comments other than it felt like it went like that, like a snap of the finger. It was just crazy. And then afterwards, like this, this huge come down of like emotions. I would say that Rockville and Sonic Temple were awesome. And seeing the new songs as quickly as they're being embraced, like when we play We Love You and everybody's dancing during the techno year, whatever it is, like going crazy and like, and then to mosh pit to this, to that. And I think the people that are in the audience are confused and like, but the people that know it are, and they're like, okay, so the main reaction after those shows was like, I can't believe how quickly these new songs are going over. Like everybody seems to know them. And that was a really good feeling because, you know, a band this late in our career, we still feel young, but we've been a band for 23 years. And most of the times, if you look at, you know, the history of bands after 20 some years, they get in a groove and they stay in it. And then people want to hear the old stuff and that's it. Um, our mindset is that we're just going to do what we want and we really want to play new stuff and we really want to push this thing forward. And we don't feel like those old people. We will play that stuff because we're not jerks. <laughs> we want to play a little bit of everything, but we, we, we want to deep, we want to deeply explore what we're into right now or we wouldn't be on stage. Right. It's like a mindset. It's a, why are we here? And so um, we feel like that energy and that sort of like anticipation or not anticipation, but that excitement, from us is going to transcend into the audience. And I think we're already seeing it to where people are like, we don't know what's going on, but this is awesome. So I can't, I can't, I couldn't be happier um, because records like this, people have released records like this in the nineties and, um, and in the early two thousands where it's a curveball, And um, those at that era, of time of music, people weren't ready for it. And they become like these cult classic records where, you know, reviewers like it and the audience doesn't get it. And then years later, people go, Oh, that's the best record or that's cool. But I'm not seeing that with this. I'm seeing that people are embracing what we're doing because I think we live in a different age and I think people want something exciting. And I think people are more open and they're, they're more, they're more um, historically aware of records that have been shit on when they first come out, cause they're different. Sergeant Pepper is a good example. Um, Disco Volante by Mr. Bungle is an example. Pinkerton by Weezer is an example. Kid A is an example. Records that were just so different at the time. And I think, and I'm not putting ourselves in that category by any means, but I know it's different enough to where, you know, it's shocking. But in 2023, people seem to like shocking at this point. So we feel like we're doing, we're, we feel like in a really good spot. 